Greetings and welcome to this edition of Positronic Episode. I'm Barry P. Cook. I'm here to do a recap and review of the film, The Pope's Exorcist. Now, it doesn't come out in the U.S. until the 14th, which is a few days away, but I got a chance to see it, so I wanted to bring you a recap and review. So, let's get into it. The film starts off in Italy in 1987, and we find a priest based on real-life exorcist Gabriel Amor arriving at the home of a possessed possessed person whom he questions and taunts until the demon moves to a nearby pig which is then shot freeing the man of his possession i'll get to why i'm using air quotes in a bit meanwhile in spain a mom and her two kids arrive at an abbey under renovation that the mom apparently inherited when her husband died we then cut to the vatican and Gabriel would appear to be on his way to some sort of hearing having to do with charges against him or something, an investigation into him. At the Abbey, as the kids settle into their rooms, the younger one finds a super creepy demon mask before going off to explore the Abbey and coming upon a hole in the wall that, when looked through, seems to indicate that there was a room on the other side of the wall in which something was locked uh, and hidden away. Back at the Vatican, at the hearing, Gabriel says that most of the time, the cases he deals with are not actual demonic possessions, and that he didn't, in fact, recently perform an exorcism without authorization in the case of the guy from the start of the movie, because that person was, in fact, not possessed and only mentally disturbed, and the help that he provided them was more of a placebo effect. But he says that in 2% of the cases that he deals with, the people are actually possessed by evil. Now, the panel that he's before, which denies that they've brought him there because of a particular woman that he had contact with who died, tells him that they're thinking of eliminating his position, the position of the chief exorcist, which Gabriel thinks is ridiculous because if his position is eliminated, then it would mean that the church doesn't think evil exists. So he basically gets up and leaves and tells them if they have a problem with him, to talk to his boss, who of course happens to be the Pope. Back at the Abbey, one of the construction workers working on the renovation looks through the same hole in the wall and then actually sticks his hand through it. And when a coworker tries to help him see what's on the other side by lighting a flare, it backfires and injures him, at which point all the workers abandon the project. And something growls from behind the wall as the older child of the woman finds the younger child convulsing in bed after which, despite having not spoken for a year after his father's death, he begins speaking only to tell his sister and mother that they're all going to die. After which, he scratches his own face, like pulls at his own face to kind of like to scratch it off. Ooh, it's very bad. Okay. At the hospital, he's diagnosed with psychosis and sent home with some medication. Okay, that's 1987 Italian medicine for you, I guess. I don't know. When the lights at the Abbey inexplicably go out, the daughter goes to flip the breakers while the boy freaks out and grabs his mom's chest and asks to be fed before revealing that he has the word hate carved into his belly and asking for the priest to be brought. And when the mother gets the local priest, he sends him flying across the room declaring wrong priest. that it's the wrong priest. At the Vatican, sensing something very terrible, the Pope sends Gabriel there to the abbey to deal with the boy after having heard of the case apparently and tells him that that abbey has given the church trouble in the past as well as that the demon in question seems very dangerous upon arriving at the abbey the priest visits the boy whose name apparently is henry and begins to pray at which point henry tells him that his prayers are worthless there gabriel then shows him a coin to get him to track it with his eyes and as he does a second pair of pupils or irises show up underneath his own and then move independently of his normal pupils because it's the demon's eyes and that was very creepy. Anyway, he, he asks the demon why it's possessed Henry and what its purpose is. And the demon says that he wants to engage this particular priest, Gabriel, in order to corrupt or possess his soul. At which point Gabriel asks if the demon knows him. And when the demon says that he knows him and his sins, he asked the demon to name one of his sins, but of course the demon can't because all of Gabriel's sins have been absolved in confession by God. The demon then says, don't talk about God. And Gabriel takes that to mean that the demon is afraid of God. And when he tells the demon that, 
it says in Latin, God is not here. And Gabriel replies that God is everywhere. The demon says it's just the beginning of what's about to come. And Gabriel doesn't know who he's dealing with. He says, you don't know who you're dealing with. So Gabriel asks him to tell him who he is, which, of course, is part of the exorcism ritual to get the demon to name himself. But the demon says he's too smart to fall for that, but then demonstrates that he does know who Gabriel is and that he knows his nightmares, at which point we get a flashback to when Gabriel served in the military during World War II. Henry then coughs up a bird, a bird, and Gabriel leaves the room and goes to tell the mother that Henry is possessed. It turns out that Henry was in the car when a fatal accident killed his father who was driving and saw, he saw him impaled and that such trauma can be a gateway for the devil, according to Gabriel. The daughter begins to hear knocking in the walls and as she follows that it, it leads her to the brother's room where she finds him in quite a state and then runs away. She then answers the phone in her room only to hear her father's voice say that she needs to listen, after which the demon voice says they're all going to die. Gabriel explains to the local priest, Thomas, who's going to help him, that they must get the demon to name itself if they're going to help the boy. When the two priests begin to pray over him, Henry begins convulsing and the lights go out again. Then the demon presents Gabriel a vision of a woman that apparently he couldn't help, which I guess is the woman he was talking about when he was in front of the panel. And the demon taunts him about this, saying that even though his sins are forgiven by God, he can't forgive himself, and that makes him vulnerable. The demon then talks to the local priest, Thomas, because apparently he's been having dalliances with members of his congregation, causing him to attack Henry, much to Gabriel's dismay. <laughs> Something that the demon said during the session causes Gabriel to check a structure on the property that apparently is some kind of sealed up well that was closed by the church. And as he tries to open it, a crucifix on the bedroom wall of the mother turns upside down. And she is joined in bed as she sleeps by a manifestation of the demon in the form of a disembodied arm that pulls her into the mattress, like into the underworld through the bed. It was kind of crazy. Hearing something in Henry's room, Thomas goes in to see him alone. And when he gets up close to Henry, Henry bites part of his ear off and says that no one is getting out of there alive. Simultaneously, Henry's sister is thrown across her bedroom. Gabriel discovers some kind of underground facility, and when he drops the lighter down in to see what's down there, a giant flame erupts before he's able to run back into the house and save the mother from being completely enveloped by the bed, after which he and Thomas find the daughter being thrown around the closet of her room. Back at the Vatican, the Pope is reading up on the Abbey, but finds that everything in the records has been redacted, except for the phrase, our sins will seek us out. Turns out that the underground area is a place where bodies were kept of people who wouldn't convert during the Inquisition. It's where the hole in the wall is. Gabriel finds a door adorned with the papal seal behind the wall. Behind the door, he and Thomas find a chamber containing a number of bodies, one of which is a sort of torture cage. And it would seem that the person in it was the Cardinal Protector, who put himself in the cage, apparently, to protect himself upon a failed exorcism that happened at the time. At the Vatican, the Pope finds a sealed letter in the records, and when he reads it, he seems to have kind of a heart attack. Taking a key from the stomach of the dead Cardinal, Gabriel and Thomas are able to open the gate and go further into this area, and the further they go, the thicker the sulfur in the air, prompting Gabriel to say that they're getting closer to hell. In the hospital, the Pope tries to tell his Cardinals to tell Gabriel something, but then he can't, because he pukes a whole lot of blood up on one of the Cardinals. Gabriel and Thomas then find the corpse of one of the greatest exorcists of all time and a book in his possession that has the seal of the Inquisition on it. Meanwhile, the mother approaches Henry with a needle full of some kind of medicine or whatever. It turns out that the greatest exorcist of all time was himself possessed and that everything he did after that was the work of the devil, including the atrocities of the Inquisition, apparently. It would seem the church covered this up only to have the construction worker somehow free the demon, which is now possessing Henry, who it would seem has now linked minds with his sister and is controlling her. When the mother pulls her away from Henry, he launches the mother into the wall and starts strangling her remotely and kind of does the same thing to the daughter, only he also turns her head all the way around. Oh. Thomas and Gabriel determine that the demon's goal is to destroy the church for what it did, as well as that the demon they're dealing with is Asmodeus, the king of hell. The daughter and the mother manage to sedate Henry with whatever was in the needle and tie him to the bed. It would seem that Asmodeus wants to possess Gabriel so that he can infiltrate the church. 
Gabriel makes confession to Thomas about things he's confessed before which still haunt him, particularly the case of this one woman that keeps coming up, who wasn't actually possessed but just mentally ill, and whom he therefore left in the care of other professionals because he wasn't a psychiatrist or whatever, and it led to her death by suicide, which caused her soul to go to hell, for which Gabriel blames himself. So Thomas absolves him of this sin, and he and Thomas go to confront the demon who keeps taunting Gabriel with visions of this girl that he couldn't help, and who also taunts Thomas with visions of the girl he's been sleeping with. As the exorcism continues, Asmodeus does all kinds of crazy stuff, including opening Henry's mouth extra, extra wide and yelling and screaming and whatnot. Gabriel tells Henry he has to resist the demon, but he struggles to do so. Then the demon carves God is not here into Henry's torso, and at the same time, he possesses the daughter who starts climbing the walls and ceilings like a spider before physically attacking the mother and slamming her into a sink, and oh, she was just beating the crap out of her. The demon then hoists Thomas into the air by his own vestment scarf, strangling him, or trying to strangle him. Gabriel then pretty much offers himself up to the demon who takes possession of him, which the Pope seems to immediately realize has occurred from his bed in the hospital in Rome. With the children free from possession, Gabriel orders Thomas to take them out of there while he's struggling with the fact that he himself is possessed. Simultaneously, a cardinal at the Vatican seems to be affected in a very bad way by the fact that Gabriel's been possessed. Gabriel battles the demon as best he can and manages to hang himself off the balcony, but the demon throws his body so hard the rope breaks. Gabriel then runs into the dungeon area he was in before, at which point he seems to see a vision of the Blessed Mother, the Virgin Mary, but which of course is really just the woman that died when he left her in the care of medical professionals. Thomas then finds Gabriel there and confronts the demon and calls upon God to help Gabriel. But he himself is confronted by a manifestation and it's of the girl he was having a dalliance with as the manifestation of the woman from Gabriel's past that died attacks Gabriel. But they're able to pray hard enough and use blessed objects to defeat the two demon manifestations and send them to hell. Then the two of them visit the Pope, who is very pleased with how things went. It turns out that the church has purchased the abbey from the mother and that Henry makes a full recovery. Apparently, there are another 199 sites like the abbey that need to be dealt with, which Gabriel and Thomas commit to trying to deal with. In real life, this priest, Gabriel, did continue to fight demons until his death at 91 in 2016. And he wrote a bunch of books and articles about his encounters with demons or whatever. And that's where the movie ends. So I wanted to see this movie from the first time I saw the trailer. I like Russell Crowe and I like exorcist movies, which is weird because I'm an atheist. And, you know, I found it entertaining, but I didn't think it was any great shakes. The one thing about it that was great was the actor that plays Henry. He did a really good job. Uh, playing a possessed kid for someone so young. He did a really good acting job and he was very scary. And yeah, he did a good job. <laughs> Russell Crowe, of course, was excellent. But for me, the movie never got beyond boilerplate, you know, exorcism stuff that you see in all the exorcism movies, which in this particular case is kind of sad because this is supposedly based on this guy's real life experiences. And some exorcism stories in the past have been supposedly based on real life experiences, but, you know, I guess I expected a little bit more in the way of the guy's personal story. He's kind of one dimensional in this movie. He's not really three dimensional. And, you know, for a character from real life who was alive as recently as 2016, you think they could have fleshed him out more. I, I didn't think that they told us enough about what happened to the girl. How did he realize she wasn't possessed? What mistakes did the medical professionals make? Why did she blame him for her not being cured? How did he know she was mentally ill versus possessed? Why did she kill herself? I mean, obviously she was mentally ill, but I don't know. I wanted more about that story. They kind of only gave us flashes of it. And, you know, why is that particular case more haunting to him than any other case? I didn't understand how it was that the Pope was sensing things, you know, both before Gabriel went there and while Gabriel was there, like what was causing him to sense things? And 
why did they seem to work, you know, what was obviously a fictitious part of the story? Because, you know, in 1987, the Pope was Pope John Paul II in real life when this Gabriel person was doing his thing. And I don't think he had extra sensory perception as far as I know. So why did they work that whole Pope angle into it? Because, again, it's based on the true, true life of this guy. And we know who the Pope was in real life at the time, who, by the way, wasn't portrayed as John Paul II in the movie. So wh why did they work that fictional part of the movie? And I didn't understand that. And, you know, even within the fictional part of the story, how did the Pope sense these things? They never explain it. Like, how is it that he had a connection to Gabriel over, you know, space and time? It didn't make sense. I thought that the end came a little bit too quickly, you know. They've been praying over the demon the whole movie and it didn't work. And then suddenly in the end, when they're being attacked by the two manifestations of the, you know, that the demon attacked them with, suddenly just some loud praying works in combination with touching them with blessed objects when they've had blessed objects on them the whole time. Exorcists always do. So I didn't really understand that. The good news on that front is it seems like they left the movie open for, you know, more entries in a series that, that would be about this priest, which might give them the opportunity to elaborate on some of these things like the woman and how the priest in this in the fictional aspect of the story seems to have an extrasensory connection to Gabriel. So I guess in that respect, it's fine that they left those things kind of under cook because they could deal with them in future films, but who knows if there'll be future films. The thing hasn't even opened yet in the US anyway. And so we don't really have a picture of how well it's gonna do at this point. So who knows? I, I don't know, I guess we'll have to see. But that's really it. I mean, it's an okay movie. It, it You know, it's, it's your standard boilerplate exorcism flick with some really good performances and a kind of hazy plot <laughs> and that's about it so i'm gonna get out of here for now i'll be back with another movie review soon until i return i wish you peace and long life